Outside the Forecast on WTHR Plus is sponsored by LCS Heating and Cooling. Severe weather threats often include damaging wind gusts, tornadoes, and large hail. Seemingly taking a backseat to those is the risk of aerial and flash flooding. The reality is flooding is the second highest weather related cause of fatalities just behind heat. In the aftermath of the devastating flooding in Texas, questions about river flooding, the warning process and the dissemination of that information to the public have arisen. Here in central Indiana, we have a team of meteorologists at the National Weather Service in Indianapolis who are constantly monitoring the forecast and the potential impacts on our waterways and flooding risk. And you go ahead and rotate it down. Crystal Pettit is the service hydrologist for central Indiana. She works closely with United States Geological Survey, who maintains river gauges across the state. Data from these gauges is critical when it comes to forecasting river and water levels and the risk of flooding. We have some different things in-house where I monitor hydrographs, and one of those um, specifically is right here. And what I can do very quickly, it's rivers at a glance around central Indiana, and so it pulls in all of the different hydrograph data from all of the rivers that we have gauges on, and I can go through and flip through very quickly and see um, what what's happening with them, which ones are falling, which ones are coming up. They're also color-coded to quickly highlight, and it will pull to the top anything where there's flooding occurring. But that's more of a response to flooding. The job of the hydrologist starts way before the first drop of rain. When we see an event happening well in advance, working with our forecasters here on what, what does the overall pattern look like for the next seven to even 14 days? Do we see a threat for heavy rain in the forecast? And then we have these different ensemble models that weren't necessarily available years ago, mm -hmm. where we can get a range of solutions, not just at this point, at this time, if we put in a specific two inches of rain, what happens? But now let's look and see. It looks like in the in the forecast models, we've got anywhere from, you hear it all the time, north of I-70, south of I-70. Well, if it, if it changes by 50 miles, it could be this. Well, that can make a big difference when you're talking about a river basin and where specifically that rainfall falls. How do you kind of decipher when it's becoming a more than just a, a river or a, a creek issue. It's becoming a more widespread flood threat. Uh, well, we have access to, obviously, we have our radar data, and our radar data is able to give us an estimate as to how much rainfall has fallen. We also have observers who will call in. Um, we have severe storm spotters, and some of them have rain measuring equipment, and they will provide us with that ground truth information so we can validate the estimates that we're getting from radar. We also have estimates from satellite. We combine all of that information to get an idea of how much rain has fallen uh, and also over what period of time. That's important as well. Do you think that most people who are in flood prone areas are aware of that? If you lived along the East Fork of the White River near Columbus in 2008, you know what that was like. Um, if you've recently moved to somewhere, you have a little stream in your backyard, or you live in a city and you know, no, chances are you don't have a good idea of your flood risk. And um, that information can be crucial when a flood event is developing. New tools are being tested and implemented to help model how flooding will impact at-risk areas. This is called inundation mapping. And if you click on a particular area and open the information panel, it will tell you how much water is expected to be in that area. Wow. So anywhere from one to three feet in this little spot, if the White River were to get to 16 feet. New technology will help with forecasting future events, but we can also learn from the past. For Indianapolis, many remember the floods of Labor Day weekend back in 2003. According to the National Weather Service records, the heaviest rain was focused along Interstate 70 from Terre Haute into Indianapolis and along and near Interstate 69 from Indianapolis to Muncie. Widespread rain amounts of six to eight inches during a 24 hour period were common across eight county areas. Indianapolis received the most rain ever for a calendar day, 7.2 inches, breaking the old record set in 1895 of 6.8 inches. This heavy rain resulted in widespread flash flooding. There were numerous evacuations from homes and rescues from vehicles. Many schools were closed. Many neighborhoods that never saw flooding before were now underwater. 
There were also hundreds of flooded basements. The National Guard was activated to help with road closings and rescues at the request of the city of Indianapolis. The White River in the southern portion of Marion County came up 15 feet in just 18 hours after the rain ended. The greatest flood since January 1st, 1991 on the White River in Indianapolis met record flood levels on White Lick Creek near Centerton and produced the largest flood seen in Morgan County since March of 1913. More recently, in 2013, thunderstorms brought heavy rain to much of central Indiana on April 18th and early on April 19th. Some areas of central Indiana received around five inches of rain in 24 hours with a multi-day storm total of five to seven inches. This was on top of heavy rain from previous days. The result was flooding of numerous streams and rivers, some of which reached record levels, including the Cicero River in Tipton that peaked at 17.09 feet, breaking the previous record of 16 and a half feet that was set on June 28, 1957. So what actually causes flash flooding? It can be different depending on the type of terrain, if it's rural or if it's urban, uh, that area that receives heavy rainfall. So for everybody, we see flash flooding events happen often when we have very slow moving thunderstorms that drop a lot of rain over an area in a long duration period. So more rural areas, here's how this will be impacted. Excessive rainfall rises streams and river levels and that water can overflow as it quickly rises. Then you have all the tributaries, also uh, different uh, waterways all kind of feeding into one river that uh, gets elevated in a hurry and that could lead to some flash flooding in more rural areas. Now urban areas obviously impacted by what's covering the ground. More concrete means more runoff and that also could mean storm drains and things like that get clogged up in a hurry. So that could lead to some rising river levels as well as some water levels here. That water penetrates soil easier than it does pavement. So that excessive rain really doesn't have anywhere to go with that drainage system and that gets backed up causing flash flooding events in urban areas. And of course this is all very serious because it could really impact everybody. Six inches of water flowing water is enough to sweep an adult person off of their feet and can carry you down the road. As far as vehicles go, a foot of water moving along could move a small vehicle and even a large vehicle. You just need 18 inches of water to sweep uh, perhaps a small truck away. So that's why flash flooding situations are very serious and it's important to know your risk. So what does one of these heavy rain events look like in the forecast? Sam Lashley is the warning coordination meteorologist at the National Weather Service office in Indianapolis. He says the alerting process begins several days in advance. And we'll start messaging, hey, we're watching a certain time period, need to be aware. And then as we get closer into that, uh, we may start to include some graphics that start to pinpoint where heavy rain or severe thunderstorms are going to occur. Then usually the day before, if it looks like potentially a very significant event, we will hold a conference call for those emergency management partners um, to make sure everybody's on the same page. Everybody knows pretty much what we're thinking, the timing and the potential hazards, and then they can take that information and expand on it and get it out to the general public. Lashley says the team at the Weather Service will adjust staffing and make sure they have a team monitoring for social media storm reports, issuing warnings, and someone overseeing the entire operation. When alerts begin to be issued, it's an automatic and quick response. From the time we say we need a warning to the time you see the scroll on the TV screen, we try and get our forecasters to do that in about one minute or less. So it's a click, click, click type situation and out it goes. So when it leaves our office, it will activate the emergency alert system. That's uh, done on the weather radio. We hope everyone has a weather radio that alerts you 24 hours a day. Um, then it will uh, activate the state EAS system and that activates the scrolls that you see on television. Communication while a warning is active is just as important as the warning itself as there are different levels of warnings to help emergency managers know the immediate threats to their communities. Now, this has been a huge upgrade in our warnings over the last five years and as you said we have three different warning types. We have a base flash flood warning so we issue that it's like, hey, we've gotten a lot of rain. We may not have reports yet, but we're expecting water to rise. The, the very prone areas, low 
uh, low-lying areas, your your underpasses, your um, you know along creeks and streams that might rise really rapidly. Then, if we continue to get heavy rainfall and we're starting to get reports of flash flooding, and now it's starting to impact on say highways or major major roads, we will upgrade to a considerable flash flood warning. Again, that will send a new alert out, and that will say, hey, this is this is something we typically don't see around here, maybe once every four, five, six years mm -hmm. type situation. So you really need to get out of low areas, get to high ground, and get to safety. Then the top one is a flash flood emergency, like you mentioned, and that is, hey, this is maybe a once in a lifetime situation. This is extremely rare, very dangerous. If you're not doing the right things, you, your life could be in jeopardy. And the work doesn't end when the warning expires. The after the post event is sometimes more overwhelming than the event itself. It's very chaotic a lot of times. We actually almost spin up a post event team here like we did for the severe weather where we have a coordinator. How many teams are we sending out? Where are they going? We get a lot of phone calls, so we have to have people to man the phones. We have to uh, put information out on social media so people know that we're coming to their communities. And so we may send two or three teams out and evaluate that data, determine if it was a tornado or not. With the floods this spring, we actually sent teams out uh, while the flooding was occurring to document where the edge of the, the flooded rivers were so that we can use that with the flood inundation mapping to say, okay, it's really good in this area, it's not so good in other areas. So after the fact is, is just as busy and important as the event itself. Past events can also be studied in order to create better outcomes for future floods. Here's an example of how some local communities have implemented ways to protect their businesses and property as well as residents from future floods. Rich and I visited the city of Columbus on the 10th anniversary of a massive flood there that took place in 2008. This open field used to be a row of houses along Pleasant Grove in downtown Columbus. Every home but the one behind me is long gone after the devastating flood of June 7th, 2008. This was Columbus after up to 11 inches of rain fell on already saturated ground and overflowing waterways. It was a calamity. Yeah, I, there was water where I had no idea water would ever go or ever had been. These former backyards now belong to the geese, except for one restored home. But across the street, the Cummins Technical Center rebuilt and is now protected by a flood wall. We've got more uh, contingencies. We've been through things like this before, and, and so should another disaster occur, I think we'd be better prepared to, to handle it. 157 patients had to be evacuated after 13 feet of water flooded the basement of Columbus Regional Health and shut down the hospital for over four months. To see how the community came together during an event like this now brings a lot of tears to your eyes because um, it was really a unifying moment. It wasn't just for the hospital, it was for the entire community. David Leonard led the effort to bring the hospital back online. The major improvements include a flood wall with vehicle and pedestrian gates that completely surround the facility. All the water would end up coming in through this grate. The water would build up underneath and the water pressure then would start lifting this gate up and would act upon this hinge and act as a complete barrier from any other floodwaters from coming in. No weather event has activated the gates yet, but the mayor always watches the forecast. <laughs> I pay attention, I'll tell you that. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, uh, the warning systems that we have are, I think, pretty accurate. And so I don't worry too much until they call. And then once they call, uh, oh yeah, you know, we've got to pay attention. Because the 500 year flood may not wait that long to visit Columbus again. I'm Rich Knight, Channel 13 Eyewitness News. Even with increased awareness and safety protocols for flooding, extreme weather events are unavoidable. The best thing to do is always be aware of the forecast, potential risk in your area, and to be prepared. And anyone, anywhere, uh, be paying attention to the forecast, the weather forecast. It's really important to have an idea of what to expect on any given day. Um, know where you are, know what action you need to take to keep yourself safe from significant weather, whether it's flooding, whether it's tornadoes, uh, whether it's a winter storm. 
have an idea, what are safety actions that you can take for yourself, for your business, for your family to be able to stay safe. Outside the Forecast on WTHR Plus is sponsored by LCS Heating and Cooling.